Welcome everyone. I'm Hontim, the Clinical Director for the Center for Healthcare Innovation, CHI, and this is Healthcare InnoMatch, which is the first installment in the CHI Innovate 2021 conference series. We are broadcasting live from Singapore in the CHI Auditorium, and I'd like you all to help me welcome my wonderful co-host, the Director of the School of X from Design Singapore Council. Recording in progress. Thank welcome. you so, thank you so much, Antim, and welcome, welcome back, everyone. We're so delighted to have you all tuning in today to join us for In a Match 2021, um, and to watch the grand finale playing out before us today. Indeed. Well, I think all of us will know that it's been a rocky road, not just for Singapore, but well, for this event as well. Thanks to COVID, we've actually had two postponements, but the CHI team has been very resilient. You can't see them; they're just behind the camera here. So, thank you, team, for making this happen. Uh, we stuck through and we're finally here. So um, we didn't do this alone, of course. Healthcare InnoMatch is brought to you by CHI as well as Tomasic Foundation. And we also have three partnering hospitals, Singapore General Hospital, SGH, National University Hospital, NUH, and Tan Tok Seng Hospital, TTSH. Now together, all of us have been on a long, actually year long journey by now to look for great solutions by startups and SMEs who have ready to market or near ready to market innovations that can bring better healthcare and better patient outcomes for patients here. Uh, and we, it has been quite a journey because we, when we made that first call almost a year ago, we received 144 applicants across 31 countries. And now today we've whittled them down to the last four finalists and these four startups will be battling it out today, live in front of all of you, to receive a total of about $1.2 million of funding to test bits their solutions in one of Singapore's three major hospitals. And what's new and refreshing, I think, for the first time, the three hospitals have all committed to evaluate and test bit these innovations with common principles and common criteria. That's wonderful to see. So I think that with that, we can bring the innovations to our patients at scale and at speed. Wow, quite incredible. I think the four teams should be very proud to be here today. Huh? Mm -hmm. So while our judges and finalists are making their final preparations in separate closed door virtual rooms, um, we'd like to invite you to view the pitch videos for our top four finalists ready for the big day today. All right, so that's coming up in, in the video stream. But I think everyone knows COVID-19 and everyone knows Murphy's Law. So we apologize in advance if you have any trouble viewing that video stream of the pitch videos. But not to worry, the CGI team has provided another link in the Zoom chat room for you to enjoy the videos posted on our CHI YouTube channel in case you've got trouble with the Zoom stream. So hopefully in whichever form you're watching this, you can now sit back, relax, and we'll be right back at three o'clock to kickstart the rapid fire Q&A. Enjoy the videos. Enjoy the videos. Hi, I'm Gabriel Ollinger, and I'm here to tell you about Articars project. We are the first developers of certified solutions for robotic rehabilitation at home. Our project team combines more than 40 years experience in robotics and rehabilitation. Articars is a Singapore-based international company with full-time employees in five countries. In the coming years, the growth of aged population, both in Singapore and globally, will increase dramatically the demand for rehabilitation therapy. But therapy services for, for the elderly are insufficient at all stages and especially after discharge. There is an urgent need for outpatient therapies with the same standards as hospital care. Our answer to this problem is simple in concept. Let's bring the therapy to people's homes. We propose the first system for rehabilitation at home that uses smart robot therapists. Patients will use our company's medical robots to receive personalized therapy. Our first product, the H-Man robot, provides rehabilitation of hand movement and it's already available in the market. Our proprietary telecom software, the Care Platform, We'll connect a clinician in the hospital with patients training with the robot at home. This allows to track the patient's progress remotely and in real time. 
Our HMAN is certified for use in several countries. The Telerehab software or care platform is at readiness level 7. What remains to be done is finalizing data security and testing the complete home Telerehab service with patients. HMAN is also the first home therapy robot validated by a large clinical trial. This trial was supported by a $2 million grant over three years and it involved more than 60 stroke patients. HMAN patients had a significantly better recovery as shown by the clinical assessments. HMAN is already used commercially in Singapore, Germany, and Australia. We are offering therapy at people's homes since the end of 2020. Four patients have completed therapy so far with strong outcomes. In the test bedding, patients will undergo a complete robotic therapy plan at their homes. The outcome will be a fully tested model of the telerehab service, from onboarding to final patient assessment. The test bedding will promote the market adoption of the service. First, by providing superior rehabilitation outcomes in patient experiences, as well as important reductions in therapist workload and significant reductions against in clinic and conventional home therapy. Let's discuss now the cost of the telerehab service. Implementation costs for the adopting hospital will be minimal. One or two robot units for training patients in clinic before they begin therapy at home using the rental units. Integration of the care platform with the hospital's IT system and initial training of the therapists in telerehab. Robotic telerehab at home will be offered to the patients as a rental service. They will be renting the robot for a certain period of time. The home therapy package will include initial assessment and onboarding, unlimited daily therapy with the robot, and remote consultation with a clinician or therapist. Patients' fees are estimated at 30 to 50 sing dollars per day. Longer therapy programs will, of course, have lower rates and patients' fees will also decrease over time as we scale up the service. The revenue from patient fees will cover all operation costs. This is important. There will be no additional, no hidden costs to the patient. The revenue will cover the costs of logistics and warehousing, deployment of rental robot units, service and maintenance, and the telerehab and booking infrastructure. In terms of scalability, the service can be offered to the three hospitals with the same cost structure we just described. Simultaneously, we are offering the robotic therapy to new partners in Singapore. The company is also developing a pipeline of new robotic devices to add to our product line. You can see some of them in the picture. And finally, we are aggressively expanding our service to international markets. I'm Gabriel Ollinger. R&D Manager of RT Cares, and we will be happy to take your questions now. Thank you very much. Welcome to Orbit. Aging population is a major factor contributing to the rise in chronic diseases, and it is straining healthcare systems around the world. Singapore is no exception. In less than 10 years, a quarter of Singaporeans will be over 65. And we're already seeing a 56% increase in patients with chronic diseases and a doubling of patients with more than three chronic diseases. One of the reasons we're not effectively addressing chronic disease today is because physicians are largely relying on a snapshot of information to make treatment decisions. They often see their patients only once every three to six months or only when they're sick. When the patient goes home, the doctor has no insights into the patient's symptoms or response to treatment. But with advancements in sensor and AI technology, we now have the ability to objectively and continuously monitor patient well-being, symptoms, and treatment response. These digital biomarkers are providing physicians with unprecedented insights to effectively carry out early and ongoing intervention and personalized care. This can delay disease onset and prevent adverse events from happening. However, it is difficult to tap into this tremendous opportunity as the current digital biomarker landscape is fragmented and operating in silos. It is extremely challenging for physicians to navigate and adopt. 
Not to mention with more patients having multiple chronic diseases, more than one digital biomarker and device will be required for a single patient. In order to capitalize on the value these new tools can bring, a centralized service platform is needed to integrate them into the current clinical workflow, so physicians can adopt them in routine clinical practice to benefit patients and make real impact. Welcome to the Orbit Digital Biomarkers Lab. The platform connects institutions and physicians to the patient's home. Integrate digital biomarkers into the routine clinical workflow regardless of who's providing them. It enables physicians to access new solutions, prescribe one or more solutions that are suitable for each patient, on-demand access patient-centric insights even with multiple solutions, and ultimately personalize treatment and care for each patient. This allows for early participation in the patient journey, encourages patients to take ownership of their health, and shifts the chronic disease paradigm from a reactive to a proactive approach. In addition to the platform technology, Orbit offers offline logistics support such as physician training and patient onboarding, as well as platform maintenance and tech support. Orbit Lab creates tremendous impact on three levels. First, a new chronic disease management model will emerge to improve patient outcomes, quality of life, and ultimately save cost. Furthermore, institutions will have a new business model to support the validation of these new tools. This will further strengthen Singapore's position in healthcare across the region. By joining the currently siloed digital biomarkers landscape, unprecedented data insights can be generated to power breakthrough clinical approach and innovation. For our test bedding program, we'll focus on the Parkinson's disease vertical and enable physicians to apply these solutions to a single patient to address common comorbidities. The solutions monitor motor fluctuations and gait quality to enable effective treatment personalization and to assess cognitive impairment to detect dementia and Alzheimer's early. With Orbit Lab, the separate insights will be pulled into a single patient-centric dashboard to support clinical decision-making. During the six-month test bedding period, we'll assess the usability and workflow integration of the platform and the ability to provide better care for patients with new digital solutions. If successful, downstream adoption will include the expansion of digital biomarkers offering and the expansion into other disease areas. Orbit Lab has a B2B business model that primarily focuses on healthcare institutions and physicians. The platform implementation includes a one-time setup fee, followed by a yearly subscription fee. As for the three digital biomarkers, Naptune and Portabilis offer a yearly subscription per patient for continuous at-home monitoring, and ViewMind offers a pay-per-test model for each patient. The total cost of Parkinson's disease is over 11,000 Singapore dollars per patient per year, contributed by treatment, home care, and productivity loss. There are over 8,000 patients in Singapore, which amounts to over 88 million per year. If we get this right, Orbit Lab can significantly alleviate these cost burden. Our team comprises of industry, clinical, data science, and tech experts to support and grow with our customers. Our advisors are world-class industry, business, and clinical experts, and we'll be hiring a dedicated project manager to ensure test bedding success. Thank you very much. At Orbit, we are committed to delivering tomorrow's chronic care solutions today. There are 25,000 epilepsy patients in Singapore, of which one third is having regular seizures despite treatment. EG, measuring the brain waves, is crucial in diagnosis, prognosis, and monitoring of epilepsy patients. However, the analysis and the reporting of the EG data is time consuming and subjective. I'm Jurgen, I'm CCO and partner in Epilogue, and I'm very honored to present here our solution for those patients, the EG Passport, which offers an objective analysis of the EG data in a remote cloud-based fashion with clear reporting, including comorbidities like sleep and heart rate. Next to the EG Passport, in the second phase, we will also offer home monitoring of the EG to observe and monitoring the patients on a longer term at the comfort of their own home setting. 
Now, this is really a game-changing solution where the data is recorded in hospital or out hospital. Data goes to our very secured cloud in infrastructure in Singapore, will be processed in a very timely manner, and the doctor can interpret the results, discuss them with the patient, and focus on the patient. How we will do this? Well, the test padding project will have two phases. First phase will start with a workflow workshop to really know the specific needs also of the clinicians and, of course, the uh, IT department. After the passport adjustment, we will roll it out uh, in hospital. Second phase will be the home monitoring, EEG, which will start with an in-depth training of the technician or nurse who will uh, do the EEG montage before we move into the uh, testing at the patient's uh, home setting. After the test bedding, um, we will see that there's a significant impact. First of all, it saves a lot of time and resources versus manual visual analysis. Secondly, it optimizes the workflow, potentially increases patient throughput and limit waiting lists. And thirdly, with the home diagnostics um, and the longer term recordings, it will give more data to the doctor to monitor the patient. And it happens at the patient's home, which is more comfortable for epilepsy patients. After the test bedding project, there's a clear business model to move forward. For the EG Passport, it's a yearly subscription model attached with services. For the EG Home Recording, there's a cost per patient and, of course, a minimum number of patients. With Epilog, we're very enthused to do this project and to bring our solution not only in Europe and the US, but also to the Singaporean clinicians and patients. Our multidisciplinary team has worked really hard uh, on this solution and is very proud that we can offer this to you. So thanks so much and I hope we can collaborate in the future. Hi, I'm Jin Shen from Rotary AI. I'm here to present to you our tele rehab solution. And here's our team, which consists of Ami, me, Danish, and Sora. And here's our problem statement. Rehab can be a time-consuming and repetitive process, which often requires good patient compliance and timely guidance. Hence, we came up with a solution, which is to deploy an AI therapist to the patient's mobile device. The AI therapist will guide the patient through the rehab, it will provide remote feedback, guidance, and monitoring functions, and hence maximizing patient's autonomy, communication, and therapeutic outcomes. So our solution, Ally Care, consists of two components. One is the patient's mobile app, and the other one is the command center web app. The patient mobile app allows the patients to perform rehab from anywhere. They could even connect an external display for enhanced experience. While they are performing the rehab, the app provides real-time posture feedback to guide the patients into the correct posture. The session data is then recorded and uploaded to the command center for the therapist to review. The app also notifies the user of the upcoming consultation and rehab. Let's take a quick look at a short demo. This is a knee band demonstration. Watch how the app guides the patient. Bend your knee more. The app ensures that the patient bends the knee Hold your leg for 6 seconds. Keep your back straight. The app also ensures that the patient's back is straight. 1. Once the patient holds for the required holding time, that's considered one repetition. Don't move your leg, hold it. If the patient moves his leg before the holding time is up, the repetition is not counted. And here's our command center web app. It allows the therapist to design rehab plan from our exercise library, assess trends and statistics, 
view breakdown of patient's rehab session, provide feedback to patients as well as to manage video consultations and rehab. Here's our test bathing patient journey map. Starting from the inpatient, the patient will be onboarded to the patient app. He will be brief and a rehab plan will be uploaded into his app. Using the app, he will be able to perform rehab with minimal supervision from the therapist. After he gets discharged to the outpatient, he can continue to perform rehab with the patient app at home. And he will be able to receive rehab plan updates at home as well via the patient app. And this continues until he recovers and gets discharged from the outpatient. And here's our test bedding route plan, which will start off with two-month internal trial with the therapist, who will be fine-tuning and testing our solution. After that, we'll branch off into two tracks in which we'll test the TKR exercises for the inpatient. We'll be onboarding 30 of them, supporting up to seven TKR exercises at that point. Once the patients move off to outpatient, we will have been able to support nine TKR exercises. And for the second parallel track, we are supporting shoulder exercises up to eight of them. And we'll be onboarding 15 of these patients. For test bedding evaluation, we will be assessed based on the number of TKR and shoulder injuries patient onboarded, the number of knee and shoulder exercise supported, at least a reduction of one follow-up visit, and achieving more than 80% for patient and therapy satisfaction index. Lastly, a reduction of 20% for therapies to patient time. Allied Care helps the patient cut down on the number of follow-up visits as well as reduce the waiting time for appointments. For therapies, they now have improved monitoring of the patient's progress, ease of patient management, as well as the reduction of therapies to patient time. So what differentiates us from our competitors? Our product only requires our patient's mobile device and the app to function. We are designed for therapies and patient in mind, and we are rehab focused. So here's our business model. As a tele-rehab solution provider, we work with the hospital to come up with the most suitable tele-rehab package, and we continuously improve based on the feedback from the hospital to support new exercises as well as improve on them. The hospital will use our product to service the patients to enhance the rehab experience. And here's a look at our implementation costs. There's a one-time infrastructure fee of $6,999, exercise integration charge of $1,999 per exercise, as well as a monthly tiered pricing for the number of patients the hospital would like to support, such as 100, 250, 500, and 1,000. Thank you for your time. Okay, welcome back, everyone. Welcome back to Healthcare InnoMatch, and I'm Hon Tim, for those of you who just joined us from CHI, and with me is Tamsin Bullock smith from Design Singapore Council. And, um, well, you've all seen the videos, uh, and uh, it's time, actually, uh, to get ready for the upcoming uh, event, which is the Rapid Fire Q&A session, where our four finalists, the ones that you saw just now, will have each five minutes to be paraded virtually in front of our very, very fierce judging panel. So that's quite a challenge for the team, Tom Tim, isn't it? So what's at stake here today? What could the finalists potentially walk away with? Well, each will have a funding of up to 400,000 Sing dollars for grabs. And the top three out of the four, the top three startups or SMEs will be matched to one of our three participating hospitals to carry out their test bidding project. Wow. Well, that sounds very exciting today, doesn't it? I can't wait to see who's going to emerge victorious later on. But without further ado, let's call upon our judges. Right. So first to join us on screen, we have Mr. Lim Hop Chuan, Chief Executive of Tomasek Foundation Visibility. Hello. Hi, Ms. Lim. Hi. Next, hello there. Good afternoon. Hello. Hello. Next, we have Mr. Colin Lim. Chief Information Officer and Group Director for Infocom Technology and Data from the Ministry of Health. Hello, Colin. Hi, Colin. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Coming up next, we have Professor Kenneth Quek, the CEO of Singapore General Hospital. Hi, Hi good afternoon, everyone. Hello. Hello. Good afternoon. Hello. Hello. Followed by Professor Emrick Lim, the CEO of National University Hospital. Good afternoon, everybody. Hello there, Hi, thank you for joining us. And finally, Dr. Eugene Fidelito, the CEO of Tantop Seng Hospital. Hello, and good to be here. 
Hello, thank you so much for joining us. Welcome to all of our judges. Hello, yes, welcome everybody. All right, so judges and of course audience as well, all of you have already seen and familiarized yourselves with the four video pitches that we screened just now. I'm very sorry for the pixelation, but we hope you caught it on our YouTube channel as well. So that was all pre-recorded, but it's now time to meet them live one by one. And they're going to be making their appearance in no order of merit, of course, with Articas leading the, 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 the show, followed by Orbit, and then Epilogue, and then Rutili. So we're ready to get the show on the road, but before we do, and before we get to the rapid fire q and A, I would like to see how we can involve our audience, our viewers at home, who've been patiently sitting by waiting to see how everything will play out. I want you to imagine that we're very, very generous and we've given you all $400,000. I hasten to add it's an imaginary $400,000. But nonetheless, if you had $400,000 to invest in one of the teams today, which one will you choose to give your funds to? Of course, you can't make your decision yet. You need to hang on and listen to the rapid fire Q&A coming up. But please stay tuned because there will be a polling function opening up later today where we will ask you to make your vote for your favorite team and we will reveal the results later on today. Great. Right, so you guys will be the judges alongside our five judges uh, on screen as well. Okay, without further ado, let's begin our rapid fire Q&A. So good luck to every finalist that has made it thus far. First up, let's get our first team, Articares from Singapore with their solution titled Smart Robot Therapist at Home. Those of you who saw the video will know that it's a scalable solution for robotic assisted tele rehabilitation from home. Let's call upon the team from Articares, Dr. Gabriel Olinger, their head of R&D, Dr. Asif Hussein, the CEO and co-founder, and Dr. Karen Chua, their clinical research partner. Hello to the team from Articares. Hello. Hello. Hi, everybody. All right, Hi, we hope everybody. Hi, everyone. Here and see as well. That's great. All right, so we now like to invite one of our judges, Mr. Lim Hop Chuan. Could you come on screen and pose your questions to Articas, please? Mr. Lim, over to you. Hi, uh, hi, uh, Dr. Gabriel and your team. Um, congratulations on being one of the finalists, and it was an excellent uh, presentation you gave. I think in your Thank presentation, you, you covered uh, various issues that are necessary for the successful implementation of a project in a home resident home setting, such as integration, cost, and then you have your accessory training devices. Uh, for many of these uh, uh, home therapy, we are dealing with uh, elderly patients that are not conversant with English. I do not know whether you have uh, addressed this issue to say, if they're not conversant in English, is there another uh, uh, language or dialect or and secondly, a second question on this is that the cost of $30 to $50 per day seems quite high. Do you have a sense of how much this cost figure will be when it's fully implemented at scale? Let's say if you are successful and then we eventually implement it in all the hospital, what would the cost figure be like? Thank you. Maybe I can answer on this one. So first, thanks for the question. Uh, I think it's uh, very valid. So for the first question regarding, I would, uh, regarding the language itself, so uh, since we're based in Singapore, we are very familiar with the different languages that have been there. We have already implemented Mandarin. We are always working with other languages as well. But beside this, I think the focus of all the games that have been done with the robotics have been designed with an idea that you don't need a lot of language to work with these games. So most of the games are intuitive enough that even if you're not familiar with English and you have to use it, the games are designed with more visual cues rather than language-based cues to make people work with them. This we validated during clinical trials as well. It's all, it always has been validated in hospitals in Singapore, like in SGH, in Tentoxing, in a lot of different places already. So we are quite confident of language. Now coming to the question regarding cost, I think you're 100% right. We are also aware about the burden of cost of these things. Uh, but what we have already done, I think we are showing how overall costs are at least 20% less than if we had to send a therapist home in this. It's increasing the therapy by at least three times compared to if it was done in a hospital-based environment. And most importantly, the recovery of the patient we have seen already by trials done in homes in Singapore is more than two to three times. So if you're looking at a longer run, these costs would be lower. Still uh, going down the road, we think as the solution scales up, we have shown it in our business model as well, that the prices will significantly go down year by year 
as the model scales up within the environments in Singapore, we are also trying it in Germany as well. So as it scales up, the cost will go down. Right, Mr. Lim, any, any further questions from you? We've got two minutes left on this Q&A. Uh, my fellow judges, has any questions for them before I ask the next one? Perhaps, uh, Prof. Emmerich, any questions from you or any of the judges, please? Yeah, happy to, to, to hear them. Okay, I have a question and thank you very much for your excellent presentation. Uh, it's just a follow up on a question that uh, uh, we'd actually asked the last time using the uh, existing RTKR platform and uh, knowing that a stroke is probably one of your uh, main applications uh, uh, clinically, uh, would you be able to uh, scale this to have an exoskeleton that would work on spasticity? Because spasticity is one of the major problems in stroke. Uh, Prof. Emrick, thank you for the question. Maybe I can take that question. Mm -hmm. uh, in our trials, we actually excluded patients who had moderate to severe spasticity because, as you understand, the H-band is a self-paced robot, meaning that the patient actually has to initiate the movement on their own. Uh, extremely spastic patients would have the spasticity initially treated with botulinum toxin or medications and then uh, be placed on the robot training to actually increase the range of motion, the motor activation, repetitive training, etc. Um, so you mentioned about exoskeleton. So as you know, the h man is an N effector. And uh, we know that actually N effectors tend to cost much less because they have actually much less hardware actually in them and therefore they are lighter, they are portable. And this is essentially the main important feature of h man that it is portable enough to be easily integrated in the clinic and back home. Uh, if we went back to an exoskeletal model, then we would be dealing with a lot more weight and hardware and footprint and cost, etc. So I really think that when we implement robotics uh, to a clinic or a home patient, it is very vital that the clinicians are the ones that are prescribing and screening patients. So in answer to your question, a patient who has severe spasticity would need to have the spasticity initially treated with botulinum or medications bring down the MAS rate by at least 1 to 1.5, which is achievable on medication, and then uh, select the patient again for robotic training uh, and monitor the patient to make sure that the spasticity continues to actually regress with treatment, which it could with repetitive treatment and exercise. Uh, but we have seen a minority of patients who actually get worse on robotic training. So whatever it is, the monitoring that we have on robotic metrics uh, virtually or in clinic would let us know if the patient is actually participating uh, and improving on actually metrics or on our outcome measures. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Karen Chua. And thanks, judges. We are out of time for this for the first team. And so let's uh, say thank you to Gabriel, Asif, and Karen for uh, Articares. And it's time to move on to team number two. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, thank Articares. You. So next up, our second finalist is Orbit Lab Solutions PTE Limited. Uh, their solution titled Orbit Digital Biomarker Lab is, is a digital health solution that enables effective chronic disease management at home. So let's meet the team whose mission it is to connect doctors to, to optimally manage disease of their patients. We have Ms. Patty Lee with us, the CEO and co-founder. Welcome. We have Dr. Franz Pfizer. He's the co-founder. I hope I pronounced that correctly. <laughs> and Stuart Jameson, the technical lead. So, okay, perhaps we could start with Ms. Colin Lim. Do you have any questions for Orbit? Hi, good afternoon, everyone, and congratulations to the Orbit team. I've got two quick questions. First one was, uh, given that Parkinson's disease takes a long time, how would you measure your success in this relatively short period? Then the related question is on your business model. Uh, I see your annual fee would be the order of 120,000 a year. Uh, in your mind, who pays this fee and who captures the value, the benefits that you're generating? Thank you. 
for your thank you, um, Mr. Lim, for the questions. And uh, maybe for the first question, um, I'll let Dr. Franz to answer. Uh, we've actually um, consulted with the clinical partners uh, guide and got their guidance throughout the process because we do understand, you know, the Parkinson's disease is a long-term disease. Um, and we've actually come up with KPIs that can enable us to actually test the not only the usability, but also the um, clinician and the patient benefit. So Franz, maybe you can get onto a little bit more detail on that. Yeah, so we have established some KPIs to measure even in that short period of time, the advanced usability of the solutions, um, the improved care um, from the physician's perspective, and then the improved clinical outcomes and the patient benefits um, during that period of time. And um, yeah, together with the doctors um, at the hospitals, we uh, have gotten to a confidence level uh, that we uh, will achieve this even in this short period of time. Thank you. And, and, and oh, sorry, carry on, please. Sorry, no. And the other questions about cost. Um, so there are actually two levels of cost here. One is really the platform, and the other is really all the digital biomarker solutions. So in terms of the platform, it's sort of like the IVD analyzers that you have in the lab, um, which then you can hop on many different reagents and test to perform in the future, because our platform doesn't just apply to Parkinson's disease, because later on down the, down the road, we can actually scale to other chronic diseases. Um, and with the platform, it is a subscription fee, and um, we've actually given significant um, discount um, to the uh, partner hospital um, you know, it's instead of uh, 120, it's actually 100 um, for every year. And um, this would be paid by the hospital because it's like my analogy with the IVD analyzer. Now, the um, second level, which is the digital biomarkers, um, for each of the digital biomarkers, actually, that is um, very suited for some of the schemes that Singapore has for chronic disease patients, like the 700-500, that would fit really well in this um, perspective, um, which can come to a co-payment system, where, um, for, for example, if you look at um, Neptune alone, although at the moment the unit price is 1500 per year for patient, but um, over 50% of Parkinson's patients have recurrent falls. And each fall, if we can prevent it, um, would cost, the fall itself can cost at least 3,000 Singapore dollars for hospitalization. So um, if you look at that, a yearly cost of 1,500, preventing at least one fall in one patient, we're already winning in this game. So um, that's, that's really the value that we bring by, making sure that we can really optimize the symptom control of Parkinson's patients. Thank you so much. Thank you, Colin. Did you have any more questions? Or I just want to thank Franz and Becky. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Eugene. Um, yes, thank you very much. Um, just two quick questions. Number one, the addition of the VR sensor. Could you speak to the, the utility of adding that additional VR sensor? And the second question is the extension to other conditions. What are your thoughts there? Yeah. Thank you. Sure, I can, I can take this as well. And then maybe Franz, you can add as well. Um, for the VR sensor, we're actually using HP and it's very easy to implement. Um, it is a console that you can just put in the doctor's office and um, the patient just needs to wear it. Um, and then the test can be conducted. Um, the tests are um, in a sense um, objects that the patient would actually look at in the VR console that we can test track the eye movement. Um, so it's just one console within the hospital and it can be applied to many patients. Um, and the extension of the disease area, currently it can um, work on Parkinson's disease um, for detecting uh, mild cognitive impairments as well as dementia, and then also Alzheimer, but also at the moment um, with MS as well. Thank you so much to the orbit team and thank you judges for some excellent questions there. Time is perfectly up there. I'm sorry we didn't get to speak to all of you, but I think we're ready for our next team to come on stage now. Thank you, orbit team. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, orbit. Thank you. All right, moving on, let's go to uh, contestant number three. That's Epilog from Belgium, whose solution you all recall is an EEG passport that's hosted on a secure cloud. And that will allow healthcare professionals real-time access to EEG data and report, uh, reported outcomes, therefore enabling faster intervention and future home monitoring uh, purposes as well. 
So let's bring the team on. We've got from Epilogue, Mr. Jürgen van Broek, the CCO and partner, as well as Professor Peter van Mierlo, CTO and co-founder. And I hope we pronounced that right as well. Yeah, perfect. Welcome. Thank you so much. All right. <laughs> Welcome to both of you. And um, let's get our judges. So Colin, can we start with you, please? Uh, congratulations, Epilogue team. The EEG passport sounds very exciting. I've got a similar question in terms of the business model and who captures the value as well as who pays for it. In a public healthcare setting, as you appreciate, we've got the hospitals, we've got the government, the patients, and the insurance providers. So where's the value capture? Who benefits? Thanks. Thank you so much for your question. Um, so the value of the EG passport, if we're talking about the in-hospital uh, solution uh, as a first step, let's say, um, there, there's a lot of value for um, the hospital itself, uh, the clinician, uh, sometimes also technician nurse, um, who normally has to uh, vis visually or manually uh, inspect and analyze the EEG, um, where we are doing this with the algorithms um, in a standardized fashion, saving them significant time, but also adding certainty to the diagnosis. Um, so it's immediately saving, let's say, resources, uh, which could be used maybe to see more patients uh, or focusing more on the interpretation of the patients. Um, and on the other hand, of course, there's, um, there's also value for the patients that they have a clear passport, uh, which could enhance patient communication. For insurance funds, still now, we didn't uh, have discussions on that, but that's definitely on, on, the, on, the, on the radar. Uh, there, of course, there could also be value that if epilepsy patients or other patients with neurological diseases are uh, monitored well um, and the treatment itself is uh, monitored well, um, that this also could, of course, add value there, um, that uh, there's the right treatment to the right patient, which, of course, uh, is there also and cost saver at the, at the end. Um, so... This is something we have um, in our current um, work with European and, and US hospitals. Uh, we have a, a clear value dossier and a budget impact model there, um, which we then make yeah, also tailor-made on, uh, on the hospital and, and we can provide. Thank you. Great, thank you. Thanks, Colin. Uh, and uh, next, maybe Prof. Amrik, do you have any questions for uh, Epilog? Um, yes, I do. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Jürgen and Prof. Peter. Um, just um, a question of pure scientific interest. Uh, with the large data sets that you have been gathering and you seek to gather in Singapore, would you be looking at other pathologies like depression or dementia? Yes. Yeah, so we have already done uh, some work in dementia. So we have already did a pilot uh, where we showed that you can see that actually the brain slows down in dementia patients so they slow more show more slow waves um, and we also look at yeah, sleep pathology so we have overnight uh, recordings and i think this is uh, very much underlooked by uh, the society so sleep has a big impact on the patient's life and we have the data so we can see how good the, yeah, the patient sleeps and whether there is a link uh, with cognition so we are on this road and of course uh, all the data that we gathered uh, can be used uh, to get there. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, uh, we do have a bit more time. So any questions from any of the other judges? Great, all right. So we'll answer um, uh, Epilogue and uh, we'll see you a little bit later again. Thank you very much to Epilogue and to the judges as well. Now, thank you audience, so thank you. Thank you. Audience, uh, we've got three down and one more to go. So please hold your votes and cast them after you've listened to all four uh, Q and A's. All right, Hamza, over Absolutely. to you. Absolutely. So the standard is very high this year, as you know. Last but not least, our fourth finalist, Rutley AI, presenting to us their solution, Ally Care, your ally for tele-rehabilitation, which is an artificial intelligence-based tele-rehab system that therapists can use to deliver remote rehab for their patients. So I'm delighted to welcome Mr. Amit Jindal, the CEO and founder, and Mr. Lin Junsheng, the director. Welcome. Judges, Hi. I would love to hear what questions you have for Rutali. Perhaps I can start with uh, Mr. Lim Hock Chuan. 
Hi, Amit and Chin Shen. Once again, congratulations for being one of the four uh, finalists. Um, compared to the other three projects, I have a sense that your projects are a little bit more upstream. So if you win this uh, healthcare in no match and with the sum of money, you do what you set out that you will do uh, in your submission to us, what else do you need to do uh, to bring your project to full implementation? So let me take on that question. So I, for us, we, we have proposed a few sets of exercises that we want to tackle. And this would, uh, it would take some time for us to work with the hospitals to actually fine tune these exercises as the success of our product actually depends on how usable is the product for each of our patients. So, so we are dealing with maybe elderly populations where they have a uh, difficulty in trying to understand uh, certain, certain technologies and so on. So we have to uh, go through a, a trial to actually uh, verify that our design can be comprehensible by them and whether there is there any additional add-ons to our product that could actually help them to uh, have a better experience. For example, we considered trying to uh, project our uh, in, uh, camera footage from the app to uh, external display to help them have a better, uh, better visual experience when they are working with the app especially when it's a small phone, you want to have a better display. Uh, we'll consider about how can we uh, deliver better analytics to the uh, therapies because the most one of the most important point of our product is how can we help the therapies to uh, have an easy way of identifying any patients that are struggling with certain part of the rehabilitation, then the therapies can actually put more emphasis on these patients yeah, we want to be able to present the data in a easy and comprehensible way for the therapies. Yeah, do you have anything to add on that, Amit? Yeah. Uh, yes, I think uh, apart from that, we also plan to currently we are focusing on the TKR and shoulder exercises for this test bedding plan. Uh, but uh, with this um, uh, if test bedding, we can also add more uh, broad range of exercises and cover uh, more rehabilitation exercises because uh, we don't use sensors. So uh, this can give us easily a wide um, range of exercises we can add easily in our uh, already existing app. So that's the value proposition. Thank that's you very much. Oh, sorry, carry on, sorry. Just a quick follow-up question. Uh, um, in terms of uh, barrier to entry from your competitors, uh, do you have any IP that will put you in a better position or otherwise it seems to me that the barrier to entry is not that high and your competitor can come in at any later stage and just do the same thing that you have done so far? Uh, I think the uh, barrier to entry is uh, not that easy because the AI technology which we use to get the post is uh, not uh, that good uh, available to everyone. So there is a lot of... Uh, uh, internal development that has gone to fine tune to work it for uh, this rehabilitation condition and uh, the, the code base that we use for different exercises uh, giving the feedbacks live it's uh, in all internal uh, protected ip so it's uh, not that easy to uh, enter this market uh, and do what we do great thank you thank you any more questions from you mr Lindhofer? Can I ask one more? Yeah. <laughs> do, do you foresee any risk uh, in terms of safety and injury to the patient? Because some of the things you're asking them to look at the video and do, and for the elderly who just had his knee replacement, I can tell you it's a very painful thing to, to, to bend and so on. So you just tell him, bend your knee. And the guy says, I can't. Your posture is not straight. I know it's not straight, but how do I get it straight? You know, and then they will try. And so there are all these issues. I, I hope you're, you're, you've thought about how to address them. Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, let me take out that question of it. Yeah, sure. So uh, for us, we, we take into consideration a few factors as well. So before you start the exercise, there's also this aspect about the pain, pain score feedback. And after the exercise, you have a, another final pain score feedback. So it's a data point for the therapies to tell whether the exercise is too difficult or it does not work well for the patients. And if the, if the at any point, the patients could also 
finish the exercises early. So these are actually uh, serve as an indicator for the therapies that uh, the patient is not able to perform the rehab plan that was given to them. And as such, they will actually put the rehab plan on hold for a while and have the therapist review them on a uh, follow-up session and adjust it such that they can perform the rehab uh, up to their current level of recovery. Yeah. Thank you. Now you've had quite a grilling there. I don't let the other judges lose out on the opportunity. Maybe Prof Quick, do you have any questions for the Rutili team? Yeah, uh, th thanks very much. Uh, I mean, and Jun Sheng, uh, ju just in the interest of time, just a quick question. Uh, do we have any data so far on what would be the acceptance and the compliance uh, of, of patients to this when they're at home? How, how prepared are they to onboard onto the program and, and use uh, the system? And what do we have an idea about what the compliance would be or could be? Thanks very much. Thank you. Hitting, hitting the team with a killer punch before they finish. Yeah. <laughs> Rutley, your response to that? Do you need a moment? <laughs> <laughs> Two seconds on it. All right. Yeah. I think the question had to do with compliance at, at home when the patients are not really being monitored per se. You know, and they're left to their own devices. Yeah, so uh, I think uh, I'll, I'll say that we do not have uh, data on hand, but our we have a mechanism in place to actually get uh, the data for compliance. So for, for us, uh, we are actually uh, integrating a reminder system to our app itself to uh, ensure that they actually perform the rehab based on the scheduled plan. And uh, any missed session is actually recorded inside the system. And this will be flagged on the therapy's command center app. And from then they can actually uh, approach the patient and check in on them whether, uh, uh, are they, do they have any difficulty trying to uh, uh, use the app or is it uh, the rehab plan is not working out for them? Yeah, so that's my take on the compliance issue. <laughs> thank you so much. Well, I think we saved the toughest question for last year there. Huh? Um, thank you so much, Bruce Lee, and, and congratulations for making it this far to the final. Okay, thank you, Rutli, and thanks again to the judges. Well, that was a very, very intense uh, rapid-fire Q&A. Uh, and uh, now it's time, actually, we're going to invite our judges uh, to a virtual dungeon, maybe a virtual penthouse, <laughs> to do their deliberations. The judges' task is not going to be easy. They're going to have to select three out of the four finalists, and they're also going to decide who pairs with whom for the test bidding. Wow. All right, so good luck. Yes, good luck, judges. We look forward to hearing the results shortly. We should allow you to, to head off and make your decisions. Thank you, judges. All right, for our audience, don't go away. We're now going to be showing you, uh, in a short while, a video which talks a little bit more about the journey that has taken InnoMatch from our very beginning till today. And that's going to be followed by an interview. We will, uh, Tamsin and I will also have a chat with the four finalists today as well. However, I hear we've also got a bit of a surprise on the card today. We've got a special guest joining us. Huh? That's right, that's right. I forgot about that. So <laughs> after the video, which you'll see soon, our 2019 Lion's Lair champion, Lion's Lair is the precursor to InnoMatch, Dr. Scott Wong. You'll be making a very special return appearance, like the returning beauty queen. Uh, <laughs> and you'll get to hear, the audience will get to hear firsthand from him, uh, his journey that he's taken since 2019. And it's quite uh, an inspiring journey indeed. I can't wait to see Scott again. But before um, we go any further, I'd like to just remind the audience, if you haven't yet voted, now's your last chance. Quickly think about which of those teams you would invest your imaginary $400,000 into. And please use the polling function to make your decision and vote now. We will be revealing the results after speaking to our finalists and our special guests. All right, and now it's time to hear a little bit more about that journey that we've taken from 2020 till today. Please enjoy the video. Even in this day and age, startups have to navigate a maze of silos and single lanes to get their products exposed and test bedded. And we as healthcare providers are not always easy to access and we all use our own different evaluation frameworks. So really, the adoption and the spread of innovation in Singapore could be a lot faster 
and a lot less painful. So we started thinking, if we could assemble the consumers of healthcare innovation onto a unified platform, we would then convert those frustrating single lanes into an expressway. And what more if we got healthcare providers to use a common evaluation framework for test bidding and adoption. That led to the idea for Chisel. And with strong support from our partners, we kicked off the journey. So we reached out to the world with our challenge and we called it the Healthcare Inn Match. and we were amazed by the responses that we got. It became very daunting, but enjoyable to narrow them down to pick the best of the best. Innovation leads and clinical partners from the three hospitals got together in March and April. It was both an intense and enriching experience. We saw a wide range of novel and interesting solutions that address the pain points in the areas of frailty care, hospital acquired infection, and digitalization of patient journey. The selection process was extremely rigorous as we reviewed these innovative solutions. We also want to ensure that there's a good match between the hospital's requirements and the solutions provided by the different companies. Sometimes, our unique requirements cannot be met by all the shelf products. As such, this is a good opportunity for us to tailor the solutions to our unique needs. And in so doing, it benefits the hospital, and most importantly, our patients. Thanks so much for the partnership in this challenge, Jeffrey and Roy. Really enjoyed the presentations by the companies and the discussion after that that we share notes and considerations. It's really strong, uh, but we are confident that the four we have selected for our hospitals to consider in the finals will be worth the while. The Chisel Inumatch finalists have a wonderful and quite stressful opportunity to pitch their products to three major Singapore hospitals in just one sitting in front of a live audience. And the winners will be fast-tracked to become test bedding partners with these hospitals. I'm delighted to be part of the judging panel for the Chisel finals. My fellow judges are from the Tomasic Foundation and the three big hospitals, NUH, SGH and Tan Tock Seng. We're going to do our best to find great health innovation for our patients. Welcome back and we hope you enjoyed that video and thank you to all our partners for being with us on that journey. It's, um, it's really a first for many of us to have been working together uh, and developing sort of a common consensus and agreement on, on how to bring in innovation and assess innovation as well. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, I'm sure that all of the finalists have got some interesting stories to tell having been on this journey. Perhaps we should hear from them, Hong Tim. Yes, it's time <laughs> to meet everyone again. We, we're going to be a bit more casual. Yes. Oh, uh... oh, you can breathe now, team. <laughs> all right. Okay, hello, everybody. So all four teams uh, are with us now. And um, let's see. Let's, we're going to ask you all some questions, really. It's all, all about your journeys as well, because it's been, many of you have been in the game for actually quite a long time. and. Maybe this is the first time that the audience, the audience is meeting you. So we'll ask you a few questions about your journey and the struggles and the challenges and successes you've had so far. So let's start with um, RT Cares. Where are you? There you are. All right. So we've got um, uh, Gabriel uh, and, um, and his team from RT Cares. Maybe could you tell us a little bit about that journey that you've had? You've, you've had work done in, in both Europe and Germany as well in Singapore, right? So what have been the biggest challenges that you've learned from your German experience that have brought, brought you over to, to Singapore? I can answer on this one. So first, thanks again for the opportunity. Uh, Thank you. Regarding our journey, I think it's been a tough one. I think for any medical company, all the people over here, they can imagine the medical journey could be quite tough for most of the companies. For us, we started in Singapore. Uh, we started with clinical trials in around 2014. We started the whole process for this one. In 2017, we formed the company around this. 
the child units in here in Singapore where, you know, you start with something very basic and based on the feedback from clinicians, based on the feedback from patients, you realize and you keep on improving the system over time. Uh, we did it in Singapore. Then once you go to other countries like Australia, Germany, we realize that we also have to relate to that demographics. And again, we have to do those things for different populations. So the product has matured over years depending on how you get feedback. I think for medical products, it's very important. Besides the clinical validation, how you relate to the audience, that becomes quite useful. So the yeah. journey was interesting, fun, but long. I need to ask a sensitive question, and I know Karen's on, on, on the panel as well. Was Singapore more difficult or less difficult to, to, to introduce your innovation to? And what, what are the other countries doing better that Singapore can learn from in order to sort of bring innovation in? Uh, I'll try to be as uh, unbiased as possible uh, around this, uh, but um, I think overall, doctor generally experience has been similar across the country. Just the point of view might be different. How they approach a problem might be different, but the um, what they see in the problem and how they want to improve their um, population recovery, that remains the same. For example, in Singapore, the approach was again, how to improve the patient care within this demographics. In Germany, you might see it from a different perspective because they have population which uh, might have different views on certain things in terms of regulation, in terms of other things. So it varies according to how they see the view, but overall doctors across are quite difficult. You know, their opinions matter a lot, so mm -hmm. you have to work with them. Yep, Maybe yes, one team I can jump in here. Yeah, yeah, sure. So I'm Karen. Uh, I just want to document my journey with the RD Care. So we actually got to know Asif, you know, when he was uh, doing his PhD as a postdoc. So I've known Asif actually since uh, 2014 and I you know his mentor, etc. So we started off as research investigators, basically on a research mm -hmm. journey, which lasted about four years. Uh, and then finally, you know, uh, I really want to congratulate Adikas. They, they are really uh, pronto, you know. I mean, 2017, they spun, and basically in 2019, there was a product. And in the COVID year, actually, um, whether, you know, uh, coincidentally or by some amazing, um, you know, stroke, uh, they got patients to use it, okay? So, so we are actually getting each man into our clinic very soon. Um, Alps has already approved it when the final stages. So we're going to be bringing it in as a clinic product. Uh, and as Asif says, you know, doctors are different. So, so when we jump on a different platform from research to, to service improvement and all that, uh, I would say that the team that we have at CART, uh, we have a bunch of OTs, Chris Kwa, Chui Yin. Uh, we are actually working very closely together to improve the product. Uh, and we're learning so much every time about how we can make it better, how we can innovate. Uh, where we're going now uh, with Chisel, if, if we get paired, uh, would be actually to address the risk because, you know, we are bringing a technology into a person's home. There's a diet, there is a carer at home, there's a person at home, there's a pet, there's a grandchild, there's all these strange things at home, which you need to predict, right? Uh, and we need to look at all these factors, you know, if the dog decides to chew up each man, what to do with that, and all these, you know, funny things that we need to bring into the picture. But therein actually lies the essence of uh, what you're doing in bringing an innovation to a different platform. Okay, and COVID basically tells us that uh, we need to use the time at home well for the patient. Uh, mm -hmm. We have seen lots of patients uh, getting worse at home. They decline in front of our eyes. We can't bring them back because of the pandemic. The hospitals are half closed, it's half staffed. So this is actually uh, really a, a, a serendipitous springboard for such a technology to actually grow. Uh, it's been a wonderful journey with Adikas because it's not just the upper limb where we're looking at pipeline devices for you know, fingers and hands and knees and what have you. Uh, so I really congratulate them. They're marvelous in the speed at which uh, they've actually jumped on uh, from 2017 to now uh, with COVID. Uh, now basically it's three and a half years and you know, we're really looking forward to the journey together um, as partners, uh, as friends, uh, you know, they, they tend to come into our clinic on and off to say, hey, uh, I've mm -hmm. got this improvement. Uh, what do you all think? So, yeah, I mean, Asif says that, you know, uh, doctors are hard to please. Yeah, yeah, because why? Our patients are hard to please, right? We're just, we're, we're just the, the connector. 
Yeah, so our patients are actually our voice box and we reflect that actually on the standards we actually want for technology to make sure that it's really safe, we match the efficacy with research and even better. And we also need to look at the humanistic side, right? So we're going to be collecting a lot of quality of life data, subjective data about patients, you know, bringing it home and stuff like that. Uh, so this is really an exciting journey that uh, we're really looking forward to. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Karen. It sounds like a great partnership. Yeah, great. perhaps yeah. I can jump on the data sheet now. The Orbit team, I think in your answers to the judges, there was a lot of really interesting insight around the data you'll be collecting, your KPIs. And, and I kind of feel poor Stuart didn't get a chance to speak at all in the quick fire round. So maybe I should arrow him to answer a question. <laughs> but it's quite interesting about COVID. The COVID year, as Karen described it, do you feel in terms of Orbit's journey, all the challenges we faced in the past 18 months put you back or brought you somehow further forward? I think it's been really interesting because a lot of the time we've not met each other. <laughs> so it's been a very much a virtual sort of experience with the odd grab moment where you can have a coffee and you can have a discussion and using whiteboards, there's one behind me, obviously you can't see it, but to try and actually build out the, the underlying structure to uh, implement kind of Franz and Patty's ideas in a secure, safe manner was, was actually really challenging in some respects but some of the people really like not seeing other people. So they're having a great time by not being uh, social anymore, whereas the, uh, you know, some people miss it. So we've kind of had a, some people have done a lot more, some people have done a lot less, but it has been challenging not being able to get together and actually uh, hash out the ideas uh, in, a, in a more um, social environment. But we've, we've, done a, we've done really well with regards to what we've, the, 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 the kind of choices we had. Do you think market readiness has changed as a result of that past 18 months? Yes, market res uh, readiness is one really key area. There is a whole raft of people that are now realising that they're going to need things in the home, things that are more together with the guards. You don't have to go somewhere now to get what you used to do. I mean, obviously Amazon has done quite well with regards to that, but in medical healthcare, in engineering, in all of these aspects, it's all been much more focused in what you can do from your desk, your, from that room that you're actually in, from your home. Uh, and that's something that um, I think has changed the, the demographic and the mechanisms for healthcare going forward. Yeah, wonderful, thank you. Especially for chronic disease patients, I think. Yes. Um, given that, you know, it's very difficult for them to even visit hospitals during this COVID period, um, I think solutions like us, you know, all four of our contestant solutions can really help um, chronic disease patients to continue to get the care that they need. Um, and in general, chronic disease is anyway very difficult because um, currently doctors often relies on a snapshot of information. And for digital health, this is where it's really transformative that enable physicians to now be able to actually get insights that they cannot you know, necessarily get prior to having these new solutions. So I think COVID accelerated the adoption at some stage, um, but in general, digital health can really transform chronic disease management. So there's the pros and cons, and it's interesting to hear that backstage and front stage, how, how the past 18 months has really changed things in very different ways. Yeah. Thank you so much for the team. Great, thank you. And now to the epilogue team. Hi, everyone. What, what time is it in Be what time is it in Belgium now? It's nine forty-four. That, that's, that's quite civilized. All right, thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Both of you. <laughs> yeah, our first question. <laughs> Great. All right. I'll ask you also the, the same COVID question. I mean, what did what did the pandemic do to, to the innovation? Did they give it extra impetus? Was there more market demand because uh, of of COVID and, and the situation we find ourselves in now? Yeah. So for us, COVID, uh, yeah, several uh, hospitals, they, they shut down the epilepsy surgery program. So actually, we yeah, saw a lot less patient data come in, um, which also provides us the opportunity to focus on our quality management system, get the necessary audits done, get our yeah, the CE labeling, FDA labeling. Um, so for us, that was actually yeah, some air that we yeah, use then to, to, yeah, like, uh, make the journey uh, 
better. Mm -hmm. And uh, we use the time specifically to, to get our internal processes online and to yeah, in line and to, to build uh, towards the future so that we can easily be engaged in clinical trials now. Mm -hmm. um, and also our clinical products. So we have a very modular system where we can put in some parts. So if you build a new piece of, let's say, ECG heart rate detector, we can just plug it in and it, it holds within our framework. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, something that we use the time of. And now we see that obviously the hospitals are starting up again, all the, the care. Um, and we see more and more patients come in and also yeah, more severe uh, patients so with more epileptic activity. So that were postponed. So that's, uh, but now we are yeah, providing the results uh, fast to all the hospitals so they can treat uh, those patients. Mm -hmm. yeah. and that's definitely something we're doing now is also helping with, with uh, the waiting lists, which have been built up uh, by uh, saving time resources. And, and for us also even, giving the reports quicker um, so that uh, that patients could also, the patient throughput and flow could, uh, could go faster there. Um, and I agree also with, uh, with uh, the other uh, colleagues that um, of course the, there's a, a bit crossing the chasm now on digital health acceptance and adoption in, in uh, also in the hospitals, uh, which I think is, uh, is an interesting wave now. Um, the only thing is, of course, always the uh, the business model itself um, and 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 the budgets, um, which uh, I think we we all have to be creative and working together uh, with the different stakeholders to to make that happen. Right. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Jürgen and, and Peter. Great. Right. Thank you. Maybe yeah. we can just wrap up our, our chat. I have to say, you are far more relaxed now than we did a little while ago. That's lovely. <laughs> So maybe we come back to Rootley. I have to say Rootley team, when I watched your video, I thought, wow, I could do with some of this in my fitness app, you know, because working from home, we've had to work out at home as well. And I just wondered, it made me think, what was your motivation to look into the rehab space rather than maybe there's a more lucrative space in the, in the fitness world? What was your motivation for your, for your solution? Maybe I can add a little bit. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Yeah, oh, going to yeah, go ahead. Uh, so... so yeah, go on. I'm thinking, I want this in my physical <laughs> fitness app. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, so the inspiration was uh, from my uh, grandmother. She has to used to go to a lot of uh, rehab. Uh, uh, she had a knee surgery, and being in the AI field, I was uh, looking what's the current process and how can it be made better. Then I saw that no one is. Uh, um, it's always you have to go to some hospital or some other location to perform the exercises by wearing sensors. So I thought, how can I make this process better? So I, uh, so that's how this idea came by, by using the AI technology, by identifying the pose and um, giving the patient the option to do this rehabilitation at home, which helps the therapist and also saves the patient time as well. Uh, so it was quite interesting uh, because there are no direct competitors who are doing this. So the, the test bedding, uh, the uh, participation with the doctors helped us a lot in fine tuning the solution uh, for the hospitals. So it's a great journey. After. Well, I mean, you, have, you have made my day because I'm a design thinker and you finished here our lovely chat with a human centered design example. You saw a need based on real human behavior and you designed around that. So thank you so much for sharing that. And thank you to all of our finest here. Congratulations on, on making it even this far. Great idea. That's right. Do remember there were over 100 uh, participants to begin with, and this is the final four. So really, thank you very much for being with us on that journey. Okay, thank so you. audience, you, you've met your four finalists, you've gotten to know them a little bit better. Uh, and you now, have, you now have 30 seconds left. 30 seconds left to cast your vote if you haven't yet done so. So I can actually see that the judges are secretly watching this as now, but remember, <laughs> Your, your decision will have no influence on the judge's decision. They've already uh, been meeting, and uh, let's see what is the uh, popular choice, if you will, for InnoMatch 2021. All right, we're okay. counting down, I think yeah. about 10 seconds more. Well, while the poll draws to a close and the team is tabulating all the results, it's with great pleasure that we'd like to invite our special guest of the day to rejoin us. That's the ding-a-ling-a-ling. -a -ling -a -ling. Yeah. Right, yes. Okay, great. So. <laughs>
the the votes from the audience will be in, and we're gonna we're gonna um, show that a little bit later on, right? And but now, yes, I think we'll we'll invite Dr. Scott Wong onto the stage, the virtual stage. He's currently an internal medicine res resident at National University Health System, and he is our 2019 Lions Lair champion. Let's get him on screen if we can. Hopefully, we haven't. Hello. Hey. Hello, Scott. Hi, yeah. Scott. Welcome so back. So nice to see you again. Yes. Yeah, right. Okay. So finalists. Please meet a previous winner, be inspired by Scott, who brought his audience to life, in fact, in this very room. That's right, on yes. this very stage. Okay. Um, so Scott, perhaps you could bring us up to speed, or, or maybe we start and reflect back on, on your experience in Lion's Lair 2019, which is, of course, the, the precursor to Inner Match. Yeah, those, those are more peaceful times where you could <laughs> actually have a whole jam-packed room of people no distancing and mask free and at the time i was actually focusing on diabetic foot ulcers and actually even after lion's lair we proceeded quite well like i actually used my own money we were developing the platform and about to launch the clinical trials at uh sing health uh, in the podiatry uh, unfortunately, uh, 2020 happened and uh, I was actually called to the front lines where, you know, I had to don the, the full blown N95 and uh, go to the dormitory workers where in the end, we actually started to use the innovation, like design thinking processes uh, to actually create software to, for the migrant workers that actually was uh, quite well received. And subsequently, uh, actually this year, the uh, you know, uh, in, in a time of a crisis, we pivoted to using a lot of the innovation um, techniques. And now we are actually launching an ART buddy for uh, the Singaporeans to help uh, everybody from migrant workers to Singaporeans do antigen rapid testing on scale. Oh, wow. Uh, okay, I can assure you we need this. We need innovation in the testing um, because it's not the most pleasant to experience. Could you share us a little bit more about that? So when we were... Uh, at the second wave in May, I was actually, uh, you know, called to see whether we can allow antigen rapid testing for migrant workers, uh, no matter where they are. And we were literally called down to the middle of a forest and even like uh, more roving working sites. So we realized that by uh, focusing on execution, where we use progressive web applications that were automatically coded without uh, me needing to know how to code, we could deploy um, pilots in 25 minutes and we actually managed to ramp up the software to help illiterate migrant workers uh, do antigen rapid testing. So we now have about um, 100,000 or 120,000 users a month uh, with about 300,000 users uh, in, the, in total in the last 70 days. Uh, we actually helped to support antigen rapid testing for National Day Parade as well. So wow, it's uh, quite explosive growth, yeah. Well, we're, we're proud to be part of your journey, Scott. I think we have to claim some part in this exactly. journey. Exactly, yes. I think that princely $1,000 uh, that we injected into your bank must have helped you uh, immensely in your journey. I guess just before we say goodbye, perhaps I know that you'll remember that feeling that our finalists are currently feeling right now. Have you got any words of advice for them? Yeah, so I think uh, it's really great, like listening to the presentations, I can see a lot of value. And one of the things is that uh, health is a lot more than healthcare, and I'm actually quite happy to see that there's so much collaboration that is enabled. And a lot of the, you know, a lot of the journey actually begins when the rubber hits the road. So when you start iterating rapidly, you know, doing the the dirty work and really getting to the ground, that's when you really prove value. And uh, being able to look forward to the the fun times and you're going to learn in the execution phase is going to be the you know something to look forward to no matter win or lose it's going to be a fun time as long as you help patients so that's my parting words great fantastic, fantastic. Uh, Scott thank you very much it's great to see you again we are really inspired uh, by what you've done uh, we've met at various meetings and I'm just amazed to see you going from strength to strength and broadening that 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 first scope that you had to something even wider and benefiting a lot more people as well so congratulations thanks so much Scott lovely to see you again we'll see you again maybe next year <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thank Goodbye. you. Bye-bye. Bye. Okay, finalists. I think the time is nearly here, huh? Yes, I think, yeah. I understand the audience has spoken and the results are in. Great, so, so yeah. it's time yep, to reveal the crowd's favourite. So this, once again, this is your vote, the audience, uh, and the judges' vote will be back, will be coming out in a short while. Uh, they're separate, but we'd love to hear 
uh, what the audience actually feels. But perhaps right. can we display the ranking on screen now to find? Oh, okay. So we do have a winner. A uh, clear winner. Wow. Mm -hmm. Okay. And yes. I wonder who that winner may be. I hope they're all on standby. Can we get ready to reveal the results of the winners of the popular choice? I think we need a drum roll for this. Oh, where did that come from? Okay. All right. <laughs> and. Oh, and the winner is Rutili. Congratulations, Rutili. So you are the audience's choice, Rutili. So you, you've clearly um, brought something home to the crowd. Thank you and congratulations. Great. So this is where you guys stand with the uh, popular vote. I wish we had, could have given the audience uh, some money as well to throw back at you, but uh, that's how it is. But you can mask the glow of uh, popularity. Congratulations to Rutili. Okay. Thank you. All right. And now, I think uh, we know we know for sure that our judges have um, finished the deliberation, uh, and it's time for the judges' decisions now. So let's welcome our five judges back onto the screen, gentlemen. Okay, they're coming back on now. Great. Welcome back to our judges. Uh, we hope that you all are still in one piece and friends. Um, let's get our head judge, Ms. Uh, Lim Hop Chuan, to give us a little bit of an insight. Uh, I would have loved to be a fly on the wall in that, in that virtual room, but could you tell us what was that like? What were the key factors that sort of um, made the judges come to their decision? Ms. Lim? You're, you're muted. You may have to un unmute yourself, please. Well, thank you, Hong Kim and uh, Tamsin. Um, first of all, let me say that uh, Tamasic Foundation is very delight delighted to be partnering CHI, uh, SGH, NUH, and TTSH for the inaugural healthcare uh, InnoMatch. Um, we plan to do this uh, as an yearly affairs, and we hope that through Chisel and the healthcare InnoMatch, uh, we will be able to attract uh, innovators and startups who will come forward with their healthcare innovation, impactful healthcare innovation, so that we can uh, rapidly adopt them in our hospitals and bring about positive uh, healthcare outcomes. For this year's uh, InnoMatch, Inno uh, we have 144 applications uh, from 31 countries. So after a few rounds of shortlisting, we now have the four finalists. So my heartiest congratulations to the four finalists we have made it uh, so far, made it this far. So congratulations. Now the judges uh, had quite a difficult time deliberating and deciding on which of the three out of the four finalists will win this year's no match. We evaluated uh, the projects around various criteria such as the impact the project will create, the technical feasibility of the project, the financial uh, viability of the projects, by that, I mean, you may have a very good innovation, but if it's so expensive and nobody can afford it, then it's not viable. And all four projects, I must say, uh, uh, demonstrated very compelling cases. Um, notwithstanding that, I'm happy to say that the judges have decided on the three winners. And uh, each of the winning projects will be allocated to uh, one hospital for test bedding. However, the clinical uh, leads from the other two hospitals will continue to track uh, the progress of the project. And when the project is successfully uh, implemented in one hospital, the other two hospitals can also adopt them. And this way we will be able to have collective uh, adoption uh, by the three uh, healthcare clusters. And this will enable the finalist innovation to be adopted quickly and at scale. So uh, on this note, uh, let me congratulate all the four finalists once again for this for their remarkable um, innovation. I will keep you in suspense for a little longer and leave it to the MC to announce the winners. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, Mr. Lim. All right. So the judges definitely must have had a hard time. And um, now, audience, as you know, we have four startups, but only three hospitals. So. Unfortunately, one of the startups will have to walk away from the match without being paired uh, with the testbed hospital. But all is not lost. We'll talk a little bit about that later on. Okay, so let's invite another judge now, Mr. Colin Lim, 
to reveal to us uh, that startup that has not yet walked away will not walk away with a, a test betting partner. Colin, what are your words to say? Thanks, Ben. I'll leave the results announcements to you guys in a bit. But just to re reiterate what Hock Tran and Tim said, there were 144 companies uh, who took part, and the four of you are in this virtual room right now. So big congratulations to all four of you. As Hock Tran mentioned just now, uh, frankly, when the judges did our own rankings, we came up with four, five very different lists. And if we had more time, we'd still be uh, talking about it. Having said that, we have had to make a choice and a choice was made based on the pairings. To the fourth company, I would say, uh, please don't give up. Uh, lots more opportunities in Singapore. In fact, some of the judges said they'd be happy to separately talk to the fourth company and to keep the dialogue going. We still see there being a lot of potential for that fourth company. So we wish you all the very best. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. And we have now the results. The, uh, the company that uh, is unpaired with the hospital is Orbit. So my commiserations to the team, but as Colin said, uh, I think this is not the last we'll hear from all of you. Uh, there's been a lot of interest in your platform and we'll get back to you. The Chisel team from CHI will be in touch with your team to see how we can continue the conversation with one or more of the hospitals or other units as well. So congratulations still to Orbit for making it thus far. Okay, so that means we're left with uh, three more startups. All right, and um, let's see now. We have chosen these final three that will go ahead to the test bidding phase with $400,000 of funding, all right? So let's reveal the first company who will be paired with SGH. And that first startup is there. We have it, Brutally. Congratulations, Brutally. Meet SGH. <laughs> and could we have a few words from uh, Prof. Kenneth Quex, CEO of SGH? Let us know what what made you take take on Brutally. Thank, thanks very much, Hantim. Despite asking them the most difficult <laughs> question. <laughs> <laughs> thanks very much, Hantim. No, um, Amit and uh, Jun Cheng, you know, uh, I, I, I think uh, uh, myself and our team in SGH have been uh, very impressed by the by the technology, by, by the um, solution that you've provided. And we feel that there's tremendous potential. Uh, there, there are issues that we do need to work through, but we're happy to partner with you and work through these together. Um, and I see this very much as a partnership. I, I, I think um, we, we were talking earlier about barriers to entry, but if there's a lower barrier to entry, I think there's also a lower barrier to entry for patients. And I do feel that because it is uh, hardware using your own mobile phone or your own um, mobile devices, I, I think uh, patients might be more prepared to adopt it um, and, and use it on a day-to-day -day basis. So we're very happy to work with you and our team uh, will, will um, yeah, is fully prepared to partner with you and uh, we hope to hit the ground running and uh, really get something up and uh, really have um, a working solution up and running very quickly so that we can make an impact on the care that we deliver to our patients. Thank you very much and congratulations. Thanks, Thank Kenneth. Very that. clear Thank you for uh, direction on, on what's, uh, what, what you like and what, what more is needed to be done before we can get this going fully. Great. So before we move on, let's take a screenshot, uh, a Zoomy Wi-Fi, if you will, uh, of uh, the winners and their, their paired hospital uh, SGH with Prof. Kenneth Craig there. All right, so could everyone look at your screen? We'll have a quick uh, screenshot. All right, three, two, one. All right, thank you. All right, thank you, and congratulations again, Ruth Lee. Well done. Thank you. Exciting. So we've had one successful pairing. I wonder who will be next. It's between Epilogue and Anticares. I wonder which one will be paired with the National University Hospital. Right. Let's find out. Can we cue the drum roll, please? I just love saying that. Oh, oh, 
and a successful pairing is with Epilogue. Congratulations, so much, Epilogue. Epilogue. Great. Perhaps you can invite, yeah, big smiles there. Much more relaxed now. <laughs> it was worth getting up early for. Perhaps you can invite Prof. Americk to say a few words about what you liked about this solution. Thank you. Uh, so congratulations to Epilogue. Um, we think that Epilogue would be a good fit for our university hospital. Uh, we have a uh, very motivated uh, uni uh, neurology, neuroscience uh, team here. And most of all, we like the Epilogue technology, the science and the work that's gone behind it. Uh, we think that there's a, a clear, uh, there's def definite potential. Clearly, you can, there's cl for clinical intervention. We think that this could, is potentially very useful. And also that the scalability uh, as to see what other, uh, what, uh, what the EEGs can also show in terms of other mental uh, illnesses in, in people. Last is that uh, we, what we would do is uh, we'd want to get you as many, uh, as the bigger database as possible. So we will partner with uh, other hospitals. Great, great. thank you. Congratulations. Yes, congratulations thank on the so opportunity. Yes, thank you. So I think again, we'd like to ask for a, a photo shoot, which basically nowadays <laughs> screenshot. So sit up straight. Smile nice with the camera. Three, <laughs> two, one. Thank you. I think we have a beautiful shot there. And best of luck. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Congratulations. Yeah, goodbye, Pilar. Thank you. Okay. And uh, that means we're left with uh, one last company that will be paired with Pantop Singh Hospital. I must say that I've got no financial interest in this company because I work at Pantop Singh, but now I wish I did have a financial interest in this company. <laughs> but let's call on Dr. Eugene So, CEO of TTSH, to say a word on his preferred choice, and that would be Articares. Yeah, I would say that um, we, we actually love all four projects and, and really it was a tough call. But, you know, we chose a continuing relationship uh, with Articare, uh, um, with how we are going to look at the robots and now looking at the tele-rehabilitation model so that we can take it to implementation and the business model. What really amazes us is the fact that we can now take robo robotic rehabilitation out there into the community rather than have it more center-based. And, and I think that was the excitement around that that uh, uh, meant uh, us wanting to take this forward. Uh, but really, we're going to watch all four projects because I, I think it's going to be very exciting to see where the developments will go and we'll be quite interested to work with our counterparts in SGH and UH uh, to do so. Thank you. Fantastic. And congratulations again to Articast. Thank you, uh, Eugene. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Uh, screen, Thank you. Screen, screenshot time. So <laughs> look your best. Look genuinely happy. I'm sure you're genuinely happy now. The stress is over. Congratulations. One two, three. All right. Thank you very much, everybody. All right. So there you have it, everyone. Uh, our winners for Healthcare Enumatch 2021. All right. Wow. Congratulations to all the teams. I think just getting to this ending point, I'm still gobsmacked at the standard this year. It gets higher and higher each year, I think. Absolutely. I'm already looking forward to next, the next few years. And thank you to Masik for also being a constant partner in this journey with us. Right. Okay. So one more screenshot, if everyone can tolerate that one more time. We're going to have everybody on screen now. So uh, if you could show us your, uh, that's right. I'm asking your video. Give us your best smile. I'm looking for the smiliest face. <laughs> All right. There'll be a special Tamsin award for that. All right. Great. <laughs> okay. Is everybody on board, team? Okay, good. All right. Here we go. Three, two, one. Yay. Thank you, everyone. Fantastic. Okay. So. That brings us uh, to the end, to the end of InnoMatch uh, 2021. So we'd like to thank all of you, uh, the judges especially, and of course, our finalists as well, all four of you. Congratulations to the winner. And of course, let's not forget our crowd favorite, Rutali as well. Now, before you go, uh, don't forget to drop us uh, your comments and feedback on today's session. Uh, a survey link is gonna appear uh, in the chat group as you leave the session. And we look forward to seeing you again next year in CHI Innovate. As I said, this CHI, uh, this InnoMatch is the first installment in about two or three more episodes that are coming, coming up to you in the rest of the year. Uh, the next installment will be on the 13th of September when we're gonna have a great speaker, Mr. Aaron Maniam from Singapore, who'll be talking a lot about resilience uh, in healthcare and how we can grow stronger despite 
this pandemic. So we hope to see you there. It remains for me to say thank you, Tamsin, for thank joining you. us again. It's been a pleasure, and what an exciting show this has been. Thank you to all of you out there. Right, and there are about 10 people behind the screen. I'd also like to say thank you to all of you. Very, very great work as well. All right, so finally, it's goodbye from all of us at CHI. We'll see you next year. Goodbye. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.